Buongiorno a tutti. Uh, that's the end of the eternal part of the lecture. Uh, my name is Vichisler. I'm from uh, Charles University in Prague, and I'm the lead game designer of the games I'm talking about. I'm also a video game scholar. Uh, the games I'll be talking about have been developed by a group called Charles Games. We are not a studio yet. Now we are a, a, like a university group which consists of uh, students and scholars from Charles University, uh, independent artists, and uh, we have historians from the Czech Academy of Sciences. What we did, we developed two games so far. Uh, first is called Attentat 1942, which is a game about the Nazi occupation of Czechoslovakia told through the memories of people who survived the occupation. It particularly deals with the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich. The, uh, he was the rice protector of the occupied uh, Czechoslovakia and one of the lead architects of the Holocaust. And the game is about the reprisals which happened in 1942 after he was assassinated by Czechoslovak paratroopers sent from England. And this game is actually out. Uh, it's, uh, it's on Steam, you can, you can buy it. It's actually used in schools, etc. So I will talk about that. And now we are developing a sequel to Attentat, which is called Svoboda 1945, and Svoboda means freedom uh, in Czech. And this game is about essentially the liberation of Czechoslovakia from Nazis and about the events that happened after the war. So the game talks also about the ethnic cleansing in Eastern Europe, uh, about the expulsion of Sudeten Germans. They're like German-speaking Czech citizens which were forcibly expulsed from the borderlands in Czechoslovakia. The game also talks about the rise of communism to power in Eastern Europe and about the collectivization of farmlands, uh, especially in the borderlands. Uh, this, is the, this, this game is actually happening in one small village in the Czech-German borderlands and is talking about yeah, also like uh, what happened after 1948 when communists uh, took power and forced uh, local farmers to join the collective farms, etc., etc. And uh, both of these games are dealing with the past and how it kind of affects the present because um, many of the people who lived through the times were still around when the game was, uh, when we started developing the game. And all the issues these games are dealing with still uh, kind of like are very uh, vibrant and contested issues in the Czech public discourse. So, both, not, not academic, but also popular. Some, before I start talking uh, about the games, I would mainly I would like to talk about the design challenges we faced uh, when, like, when you want to do a game about contested history and about traumas of war and memories of, of, of atrocities. What are the challenges and problems you are facing? How we solve them, and particularly what I think went wrong, like where we. Uh, did actually wrong decisions because that I think could be most beneficial for people trying to do the same with uh, different content in different cultures. Uh, before I start with that, I would like to do a brief intro about kind of to put all this into context. And first of all, I've forgotten, I would really like to uh, say thank you to the organizers of this event. Uh, it was a fascinating uh, day and a half, and I really enjoyed it, and I'm really so happy uh, to be here. So thank you for making this happen and inviting me. Uh, First is the concept of ludic century. It's like famously Eric Zimmerman has claimed in his manifesto called ludic century that essentially today or more and more in 21st century, games or game-like experiences will become the culture vehicles through which consume art, design, entertainment, leisure, etc., etc. Even though it's a manifesto just to be taken with a grain of soil, the truth is that video games are now becoming one of the most widespread and successful forms of so-called popular history. What is popular history. It's a, you typically study history in school, and then if you're not a professional historian, if you're not a scholar of history, then you leave school and then typically you encounter a lot of like historical narratives through popular culture, through novels you read, movies you, you watch, and these kind of uh, can have certain like uh, imagination or like they, they create certain imagination of how certain things happened in the past. And I would say, especially for contemporary generation, this medium or vehicle for popular history is more and more video games because they, there's a lot of games now that deal with real history, with real historical events, and they kind of contribute to this shared imagination how these things happened. And if you look how history is typically represented in most mainstream video games, and it's like 
kind of gross schem schematization, but it kind of gives you. There's a lot of focus on, on, on war, especially on technology of war. You have so many, especially games dealing with Second World War, uh, they typically present you war as a as an armed combat between, uh, between, between groups of men. And so there's like a lot of uh, realism in weaponry, to topography, and, and maps, and you know, the, technolog the technology of war. But so many things are missing in these games. So many like, very important aspects of history, uh, particularly the memories and experiences of civilians, women, children, and like, the broader consequences, and like, like you know, day to day life in war. Or there are like, other very popular forms of uh, representing history in video games, and it's kind of on, on the macro level. You have so many strategy games, uh, like this, like Civilization is actually a great game, I, I, I like this game, but what these games are kind of uh, presenting you very quantified version of history, where historical events, phenomena like trade, diplomacy, religion, culture, are, can essentially all be quantified and managed as kind of bonuses and, and penalties. Uh, in a way, that's, uh, Kevin should has actually argued that this, in a way, is uh, based, or it's like stemming from the systematic nature of computer programming, game rules, and, 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 like, and the mechanical kind of bias of the medium. Nevertheless, this is not true. Like, we know that uh, this is like a maybe bias or tendency that can be overcome, and definitely there are games which uh, strive for more real or more realistic uh, depiction of, of history or human experiences. There is a huge question which is beyond the scope of this lecture. What is realism in video games? And how you can achieve realist representation in video games? Because essentially video games are simulations and they're, they're like, they, they, they are constructed. Nevertheless, there have been two kind of quotes which uh, are important for our games. One is by Alexander Galloway who argued that realist video games, if they're, if they're about to emerge, should, be, should not be defined as mere realistic representations, meaning like visual representations, but as games that reflect critically on the miniature everyday life, repleted as it is with struggle, personal drama, and injustice. And Bogost, Jan Bogost and Cindy Poremba, in their book, were talking about if we ever can have documentary video games that will be authentic representation of lived experience. And there's so many uh, theoretical, uh, caveats and challenges if you want to have realistic or documentary or authentic video game. But nevertheless, we tried with our games. We tried to do serious game uh, which would represent history kind of accurately and uh, authentically. And as I said, we struggled uh, uh, a lot. And I would like to talk about issues we struggled with, particularly because when we started, there were no guidelines. There were not that many games trying to do what we tried. And so we're kind of left in the void. Uh, but before I, before I start talking about the design, I would like to show you a short trailer for the first game, Attentat 1942, so you kind of get, have a glimpse of what, what the game looks like. To byla strašná doba tenkrát. Co ty dovolíte? Děkou jsem neudělal. Dejte mě pokoj. Odboj, to přece byla vlastenecká povinnost. dědu odvedli a já jsem si nikdy nemyslel, že ho uvidím až po válce. Proč vašeho dědu zatkli, to jsme se vlastně nikdy nedopátrali. Byl to zlej sen. Takže se ani nedivím tvému dědečkovi, že o tom nechce mluvit.
Okay, so uh, really briefly, the game is a, it's an adventure game uh, where you, uh, it's, it's a single player, it's for one person. Typically the game is uh, uh, meant to be experienced rather in an intimate setting. It's kind of uh, like, like, like a novel or, 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 uh, or a graphic novel. It's based on very strong narrative. The game is based on personal testimonies and we combine video interviews, interactive video interviews, with interactive comics, with interactive black and white comics. Essentially, uh, in the story of the game, uh, you play the game in a present, uh, but present means 2001. The, the present time in the game is 2001. Uh, where b there's the time when many of the eyewitnesses of the proctorate still lived at the end of the 90s and the beginning of, uh, of, 20, of 20th century. Unfortunately, this is not the case now. Uh, and you, uh, you, you, you live in Prague and you discover, uh, basically by accident, that uh, your grandpa was arrested by Gestapo immediately after the assassination of Heydrich and that actually no one in the family really knows exactly what happened and why he was assassinated. He returned from the camps after the war and he never really talked about his experience. Now he's in hospital, not really talking much. And you try as a, you play either granddad or a grandson or granddaughter of this main protagonist, Indrich Jelinek, and you try to discover what happened. And the, the only means of, uh, the, the main game mechanic is actually, is talking. You, you, you talk to various old people who lived through the war, neighbors, your, your grandma, uh, colleagues from his work, colleagues from resistance, etc. Et like a lot of like people, uh, people who've been with him in the camps and you try to discover what happened. You go through his diaries, you go through historical uh, materials. And so it's kind of, kind of a detective story where every person is giving you slightly a different story, and depending on whom you ask and how you frame the question, you get to a different layer of history. The important thing is you can't change history. You can't replay history. History happened as it happened. The only thing you can change is uh, what, what, what do people tell you, depending on how you ask them and who you, who you talk to and how you ask them. Um, I'll talk a, about it a bit more. The ultimate objective, we wanted to present historical events from different perspectives, kind of to develop deeper understanding of, of the past. Uh, especially wanted to in Czech Republic, I don't know how it's in, 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 in Italy, but in Czech Republic, especially if you study history in school, uh, on a, like, do not, on a, like, um, uh, high school and, and, and uh, the grammar school level, uh, not, not, not in university, but on normal school, uh, history is typically being taught as a list of important dates and events. So you have like, like, like a list of dates and events. And we really wanted to show with our game the personal stories of like day-to-day -day experience of people who lived like behind these like kind of uh, overarching great narratives. Uh, then uh, I would like to talk about four design principles we adopted in our game. And these design principles in a way are also the, the biggest challenges we faced uh, when dealing with the game. Uh, there are much more, I, I selected only four which I think are most uh, uh, important or relevant uh, to, this, to this conference. Also, um, it's not true that like we, when we started the project, we had these four principles in mind, like which we didn't. This is kind of like more something, like a theoretical framework we develop now after I look back on the five years of development and on the, like what we did and what actually didn't work. Now, I can kind of like summarize this, but there was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, wrong uh, turns and, and, and decisions we made and then we had to take them back, et cetera, et cetera. The first huge question uh, from the beginning is the question of authenticity. Like what is authentic representation of history and how you can reach that in a video game? Uh, and that's kind of far reaching question because um, uh, uh, typically, for example, we are dealing with uh, questions like should we base the game on, on uh, real testimonies and real people, and should like, we use real people and their testimonies in the game? Should we use, like, can we use comics? Can we redraw the experiences? Should, should we like, you know, do, do it in 3D and et cetera, et cetera? So there's so many, so many uh, questions related about that. And we finally, because as you know, like the game, the whole game is now based on interviews with people, like you, 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 you talk to people and you ask different questions, and as I said, depending on how you ask different answers, we finally decided, uh, after long debates and even like testing of prototypes, we decided we will, uh, we actually hired six historians from the Institute of Contemporary History of the Czech Academy of Sciences, so like professional historians, and in the beginning there was idea 
that these historians will give us some materials. They will like find testimonies for us. They will find stories for us. They will give us historical material. And then our, our designers will write the dialogues with the, with the so we like kind of uh, use the source material, but not, not literally, but we'll, we'll adapt it. And it didn't work at all. Uh, the materials like we got from the professional writers and game designers were always like, it was like a movie or theater play. It was kind of like too, there was too much like kind of like a, you know, kind of a melodramatic Hollywood, etc. And we wanted something much more authentic. So finally, we actually forced or persuaded historians that they should write the dialogues themselves, even though they're professional historians and not, not dialogue writers, because they had in their mind hundreds and hundreds of testimonies they went through. So finally, we, what we did, we used uh, historical research and we used real testimonies. So our historians went through, as I said, sometimes tens, sometimes hundreds of testimonies. But th we, don't, we did not adapt these testimonies in a little fashion. Uh, we constructed stories with authentic details. So all the, person, all the people you talk to in the game are actually fictions. Uh, th 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 there was never a person with this name. And we hired non-actors to play these uh, these, uh, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, eyewitnesses, but what they tell you is actually based on very real testimony. So typically you can say that in our game these people are, uh, or the testimonies are fictitious assemblage of real testimonies. Especially when they talk about some very contested uh, topics like the, the interrogations, camps, or, or collaboration, like issues which are really contested, then we basically used chunks of real testimonies, but we kind of like put them to a fictitious character. The reasons why we did that, why we didn't use real people and real names, were multiple. It was, of course, legal, but m the most important was ethical. Was ethical. Because uh, when you have like, a real testimony, it's a linear testimony. Like someone told you something, and it's sold. It's like, it's, it's, it, that's it. If, if the person doesn't live, and you can't you know, go to this person and, and ask them additional questions. But we had to break these testimonies into, into game dialogues. And you can't really do that with serial testimony unless you have it like, uh, like yeah, confirmed by, by, the, by the person. Also, we really wanted to or needed to do small changes. Typically, we oftentimes combine two or three real testimonies to create one character because we wanted to get more topics. Uh, because of the limited space of the game, we wanted to get more topics and more, like, uh, ex more experiences into one dialogue, for example. Uh, and you can't do that with, when you have real name. But how to deal with that, uh, especially the historians that really, uh, they really, we had like long, long debates about that because they are professional historians and they are not used to create fictitious characters. You know, that's kind of like in the, in the contrary of the, of the ethics of what they do. So finally, we, I think, reach interesting solution how to, this constructedness of our characters, how to deal with it. And w instead of obscuring it, instead of like, uh, you know, making it, making it uh, uh, hidden, we, uh, we made it transparent. So when we got a uh, very hours and hours of rare digitized footage from the, nation, from the National Film Archive, like we, they gave us an amazing uh, amount of, 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 of footage. And when the people in the game are talking about real, well-documented events, we are using these, uh, these historical archival materials to show these events. When they are talking about their own personal experiences, which are created by us, we are using black and white comics. So there are like two layers of the memory. So we kind of try to visually separate uh, kind of real events from in-game constructed events. Even to the, even to the, to the layer uh, when, where you, for example, uh, talk with the characters in present and they show you their old ID cards from the war, they are as a comic, comic props. They are black and white comic props in the, in the movie. So we kind of really tried to make this uh, transparent. And it's something like, we, we, well, if the game is used in schools, that actually at one point we invite the teachers and students to talk about that, to talk about the constructedness of history. Because, and it's very important, um, uh, question is it because if you do any documentary work and I'm someone here from from like uh, film studies definitely know that like even if you do like documentary it's always there's always a matter of selection and a, like matter of kind of authorship what you select how you frame things that brings us to another important question is polyphony uh, we from the beginning wanted to show history from quite radically different perspectives uh, not that much in the first game I will talk about more about the second one. So uh, we have uh, like uh, eight different characters in the game. Uh, they are of different uh, background, ethnicity, 
political views, etc., cetera, et cetera, gender. And each of these characters is uh, presenting a unique, very personal story, and they have very diverse uh, historical experiences. And uh, we wanted kind of to, to have that, to have this like, polyphony where you see that the historical events were, uh, can be felt really differently by different segments of the population. So we, of course, have like uh, the traditional narratives, which is like the, the camp survivor, the resistance fighter. But we also have like civilians who lived in the Proctorite, like they, daily life under occupation. We have people who, and that's kind of in the Czech context, that's kind of, uh, that was one of the most uh, contested character, but it's, it turned to be the, one of the most productive in schools. So when, like, when uh, our game was used in schools and then teachers like, really like this character, is the character of not exactly collaborator, but is, is a journalist who uh, decided to like, be actively pro-occupational regime during the Proctorate. And he's st you can still talk to him and he's like, defending why he did what he did, why he actually, in a way, in a way collaborated with the Nazi regime. And uh, uh, so all these characters, as I said, are telling you uh, different, uh, Viewpoints. They, they don't tell you different history. Like the the history is always fixed as it happened. As I said, it's it's very like very very precise about talking only about very well documented events. But these people, each of them, offer you different evaluation of these events. What they think about 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 that, and and there's like sometimes radically different uh, evaluations. For example, the assassination of Heydrich is still. There is still some contestation about it because uh, the, the reprisals were brutal. M more than 3,000 uh, Czech Jews were sent to the camps and, and uh, thousands of people were, were killed. Uh, two, two villages, Lidz and Lezhaki, were, uh, were raised to the ground and the people killed. And there's like a question like, was it worth it? Like, was this kind of political assassination worth the, 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 the price, especially that the price was paid by people in the Proctorate, whereas the, uh, the, the association was planned by the uh, government in exile in, in London, etc. Et so you can, all these like uh, characters talking about these different issues. Also the issue of the expulsion of certain Germans, even in the first game, is actually uh, appears uh, with really div divisive, uh, divisive uh, evaluations. Important thing about uh, Attentat and Svoboda is that we uh, leave these subjective testimonies as they are, and we don't uh, give you uh, kind of like inherent approval as, as, as a player. So you as a player, it's up to you to critically evaluate all the historical materials and what these people tell you and kind of to make your own conclusion. We give you some, we give you some, some materials to do that, but the game doesn't really try to enforce one perspective. Also, it, uh, this was like really a uh, huge, huge contested issues in our team. We had six historians and even among the historians, there were very fierce debates which perspectives should be included in the game and, and, and thus emphasized, and which perspectives should be omitted. And the, this is a question of, of, of selection, it's a question of, of, uh, of production, because you simply, we had like eight slots. We had like, but we didn't have money and time and resources to you know, have like 16 characters, 25 characters, we had eight characters. And there were really uh, fierce debates what to include and what not. And sometimes it was kind of hard to reach consensus, not among the team of designers, but among the team of historians. And I, and I would say that's a very general issue that any work, any, any historical endeavor, or any, any creating any historical work necessitates selection. Because you have a continuum, what happened to the, in the past, and you as the other, have, you, you have to select certain, certain perspectives. You have to select certain memories, certain, certain things, to put them to your, to your final work. And, and something, something has to be uh, left behind. So we are, in, in a way, dealing with uh, kind of similar questions any author of historical work is dealing with. Then, uh, important point uh, was inclusiveness. But we're, we're talking about uh, diversified historical uh, experiences of different segments of population, and we knew definitely we wanted to have uh, marginal voices of those who've been traditionally marginalized in the Czech history discourse, uh, especially popular discourse, including the game. So we included uh, memories of, uh, of a Roma lady. She was uh, imprisoned in a, in a camp when she was 15 during the war, and this is a uh, Again, another very contested issue in the, uh, in the Czech society. Uh, there are several, several layers to that. Uh, uh, this lady is talking not only about her imprisonment during the war, but she's also, and that's the whole thing in the game, these people are talking also about their life, what happened after the war, because you are talking to them in 2001. And that's something very important, because they lived through this whole half of the 20th century. 
uh, not only through occupation, but as, as adults, they, they, they witnessed the, the, the communist times, and, and all of them then witnessed also like the Velvet Revolution. So the, she's talking openly not only about the treatment during the war, but also about how Romas were treated in the communist times, and also about the situation now after Velvet Revolution. And the, the contestation comes from that uh, there was a camp uh, in, uh, in the Proctorate in Let Letiupisku, where she was uh, detained. Her memories are based on real memories of, of a 15-year-old girl we, we found. Uh, and this camp was actually established before the German occupation of Czechoslovakia. And it was, comp it was managed and run by Czech soldiers. So like, that's, that's, that's kind of like a really contested issue uh, in, in, in our history, because this, they had, this is like kind of a, how our own, uh, uh, our own forces actually um, uh, detained uh, uh, one segment of Czech population, and also uh, 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 even today, the situation of Roma in the Czech Republic is is, is very contested, and there's, there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, a lot of racism going on, um, and exclu and social exclusion going on until until today, despite various attempts. So this like kind of thorny issue. We really wanted to have it in the game. It was not easy to find the connection between all the characters to meaningfully include these memories, but we but we did. Um, and then last point is contextualization, because we are dealing with so many uh, really traumatic or like heavy-handed uh, like experiences and, and, and issues. We decided to have uh, to really help players to put all these things into context. So we actually asked the historians to write something like an encyclopedia or, 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 or index. So every time there is a concept or name, historical event or whatever law, appears in the game, uh, there is like a small icon and you can click and you, you can read very, very concise, very small, uh, like a popularly written, but written by professional historians, uh, explanation of this, of, this, of, this, uh, of this concept or of this event. Uh, finally, uh, the game uh, was quite uh, successful, I would say. We got a lot of prizes. We've been nominated to IGF, uh, the, uh, it's the Independent Games Festival in San Francisco, for excellence in narrative, uh, which is an uh, awesome, awesome, uh, awesome uh, result. We didn't want, we didn't, didn't want it was uh, Night in the Woods, which is a great game too, which one. Uh, so uh, we got a lot of like, critical acclaim. The game is on Steam. You can buy it. We are actually providing special version of the game for schools. Uh, it's used in Czech Republic, Germany, and New York now. And we are happy to, 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 to wide range. Uh, the game is not uh, selling that much. It seems we suck in marketing, so we don't really know. We know how to do games, but we don't know how to sell them. Uh, but still, we it made enough resources. We can continue, and we can start on another one, which uh, I would say is based on the same principles, but in a way is uh, more. Uh, these principles, especially the polyphony and constructivism, is even more pronounced in this game because this game is dealing not with the evils uh, which kind of came you know, to our country with Nazis, but more about the evils uh, which the war unleashed uh, in, in ourselves. And I will show you just a trailer so you know what the game is about again. Vykašlete se na ten průzkum, ušetříte si práci. Ta škola dělá ve vesnici zlou krev. Lidi nezajímá to, co bylo před 50 rokama. Lidi zajímá to, co bude zejtra. A ve škole zastřelili mýho bratra. To vám pan Studnička nařekl, že byl u toho 8. května 45. Pamatuju si, že teta si směla zabalit jen to nejnutnější. Kufry nesměly vážit víc než 50 kg. 
a bojila je pod dohledem českých vojáků. Já jsem byl u Dukli s generálem Svobodou. To byly i jatka. Šli jsme proti Němcům skoro bez munice. As you saw, the game is not, this, this was a gameplay trailer, like, just like the beginning of the game. And the game is, uh, as I said, it's, uh, the first one happened in Prague. The second one is happening in one small village in the Czech-German borderland. And the premise is very similar. You arrive to this village as a, as a historian working for some historical preservation uh, like society. Because uh, there's like old school uh, from 18th century in the, in the village. And uh, part, they want to tear the school down. And so you have to kind of prove uh, it's just a mundane task you have to prove that the school is not actually not important, not important, not architecturally important enough to be protected so they can tear down and expand some business. So it's like a very mundane task. But then when you arrive to the village, you discover that there is so much more hap like going on in the village because it's a very small village and the, uh, the school was actually a central piece of memory, I would say. Like it's, like, it's like a site of memory because so many things happened in the, in the school. The expulsions, the interrogations, the, uh, the, uh, the voting for the communists, the, the, exp the, the expropriation of property, etc. Et so it was like the central, which is like based on real, real story again. Like it's a, this was the point where all these things happened. And you also discover, as in the first game, that uh, your own family actually uh, has... Uh, ties to uh, what happened or that your part of your family played a role in what happened in the village. So you decide to stay in the village to again investigate what really happened. And more like in the first game, I would say in, the, in this game we much more talk about that, you know, people are not always happy that you're trying to, uh, to, to, to talk about the past and you will see like there are really different approaches also to the contested memories and past. You will see so many people saying it's much better to forget and you know move on, etc., etc. And this is like kind of more. It's more like a game, I would say, because you stay in the village for a few days, you walk around the village, you talk to different people, and also the people have certain agenda. They want you to do certain decision or stop doing certain <laughs> certain decisions. So I would say it's more like a game. Also, this game is some more, I would say, personally re relevant, uh, as I said, because various uh, even in the first one we are talking about horrible traumas and horrible uh, issues, it's still very well established narrative. Even the narrative of resistance, sacrifice and collaboration, those are three narratives which are kind of, uh, I would say, confirmed and accepted as part of our national, uh, national narrative. This one is still very contested. What happened after the war, especially the expulsion of certain Germans, is very much contested issue, which still plays a significant role in political debates. And for example, in our last presidential, uh, presidential elections, it was one of the issues which m m maybe hoped to uh, shape the outcome of the elections, because these two candidates have very radically different uh, perceptions of, of history, uh, of like, and, and, and the, the issue of expulsions. Um, so, and also, in a way, this game is really personal for me because my own family uh, comes from the region. Uh, my own family comes from, uh, from, uh, from a village in Sudetenland uh, where the Germans were expulsed. And when the war actually happened and all the like, after-war uh, poverty and, and everything. So uh, we should 
finish the game uh, hopefully next year. Uh, if you want to wishlist it on Steam, that's the P there's a PR time. If you want to wishlist it on Steam, it's, it's here. And uh, thank you for attention. I'm ready to answer any questions you might have. We still have like 12 minutes. Questions? So uh, there is actually the school version is different. Uh, there is a, there is a school version which is specifically tailored to check a uh, learning system, which is very formal. So for example, in the, the che in, in the che in Czech schools, the version you get is not like a game you can play for two hours, but the game is segmented into 20 minute segments. You can play it like you can so, so it fits into this like we have like 45 uh, minutes lecture. So the kids like they play the game. Actually, the game is played on a on a screen. So it's modified, there are only, only certain elements, and there's, actually there are some more elements. So it's like really, I would say it's less a game and more uh, educational tool, the, the school, school version. And it consists not only of playing the game on a screen where the kids like, uh, or the students uh, kind of collectively talk and decide what to do in the game, but then there is uh, 20 minutes for out of the game activities, like pen and paper tests, and not the tests, but like, like, like you do, like really you have to put things in context and work, it's more like, the game is like the material you see, and then with the teacher, you critically work on that material in classroom collectively. And so we kind of critically discuss what you saw. That's the school version, that's the Czech school version, and we actually, to Czech uh, education institutions, this special Czech, Czech educational version is given for free. They just, just need to register and they get it. And now the game has been downloaded by something like 15 to 20% of Czech high school history teachers. We don't know how many of them really use the game. We don't know only how many of them downloaded it, but we have really positive feedback. Uh, then uh, this English version, this version is like in, it's in Czech, but it's, it's with uh, English, German, and Russian subtitles. Uh, we try to sell this game normally on Steam to, to anyone, and we try to, we really try to market as a game, not as an educational game, because when you, once you label something as educational, it's, it's over. Like from business perspective, it's, it's, you're, you're done. Uh, so, but also like, because schools started to be really interested, like German schools, American schools, they approached us and told us, hey, this, we are using this game in school, and it's actually awesome. I said, yeah, we know. <laughs> so, so we started to sell them on discounted license, also like in special like bulk licenses, and we had a, a historian from New York who created like, uh, like curriculum how to integrate the game meaningfully into US educational system. But, and, and now we are working with some German schools who are using it and they're writing the, kind of their, their, own, their own like method how to use it. So yeah, so it's, it's, it's being used in schools, but we try to, as I said, this version, this version like Atentat 942 and Svoboda, we don't really um, talk about this as educational because the educational version is different, has actually even different name. Uh, and we wanted to keep it separate because they are they have different names. Uh, 